Hello everyone, I'm Brian. Today I'm reacting to how to decide the right path with said guru. So I thought about this a little bit. Honestly, I thought about it for like five minutes before starting this recording. Because I wanted to try to answer that question. And I thought about it, thought about it. And I was like, well, my first thought was, well, the right path to what? Uh, a successful life? Or a successful business? Successful life? those require two different answers you know and then it's like well then I thought about it again I kept thinking in my head like well sad guru would come up with cheat answer and which is like inner peace because genuinely that is like I think the solution to either everything some things or or should I say a lot of things or everything and I call it a cheat answer because it's like how could you how could you have come up with that answer? That's that's just genuinely an amazing answer. And it, it was a bit of discussion whether you're the left or the right. Inner peace is all that really matters because it doesn't matter if you're left or right at that point. Uh, when you're at peace with yourself and you're at peace with the people, then it it's just it, there would be no conflict. So I thought about that. It's like would the right path be inner peace? Then I, I kept thinking of outward things. But I never thought about inward, which I genuinely do believe to be the the better solution than an external um, solution. Uh, the better solution I do believe would be internal first and foremost. Once you have that solved, then look externally. Oop, let's go ahead and go. <laughs> I'm curious. We all are individuals with our own strength, our own fear, thoughts, and perceptions. My question is, how to decide upon the right path, which is right, which is wrong? Maybe the path less traveled or less... Um, no, you've been, Eng you've been reading English literature. <laughs> Little bit. <laughs> Little bit. Yeah. Welcome to that. The path... Or the path in the middle the path that is not less traveled but not mostly traveled I generally consider myself a middle of the road kind of person where I understand that one one extreme path or the other is not usually the right answer it's usually somewhere in the middle is where the truth lies or where the right path lies it's not the best path but it's a path I hate to say this but it's a path of compromise or or a which I know Osho would absolutely hate because <laughs> it's a compromising path, but it's, 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 it's and it may, maybe sometimes it not be, I don't know. Uh, so far it's always been kind of compromising paths, but it's a path where no one's happy, but no one's sad either. And I'm curious to what Seguru would say is the right path. Which is crowded, maybe it is because the people have found it more comfortable to walk upon it than the sparsely populated one. Then how to decide upon? <laughs> See, if it's about, if you go to the Comfort. railway station or if you go to the airport, which counter to go to to check in? Wherever there is less queue. Less resistance. <laughs> That's what you're saying. <laughs> no, no, I, I get it. But I'm saying, what you do in this world, whether you are a doctor, an engineer, a politician or this or that, will not determine or change the quality of your life. It is about how you do it, the context. It is never the content of life which determines the quality of your life. It's always the context of life. People may be living in palace, kings have been miserable and committed suicide many times. Poorest people have lived joyfully because it's the context of life, it's not the content of life. So what you're asking in terms of path is content. I'm sorry to pause it, but I just have to say this. I, I do agree with them. There are, there are rich people out there that have so much money, yet they don't find happiness or joy. They're constantly doing drugs to fill that void because, um, well, because they can't find true happiness. I will say this. It helps to have money, though. <laughs> I will never, ever deny that. <laughs> but it's it goes back to a Swama video that I did about uh, uh, 
oh my gosh, I can't remember. It just happened this past weekend. But about uh, the four stages of, is it happiness or fulfillment? Or happiness? Anyways, you have the the pleasures. We'll give you happiness for that time, but once the pleasure is gone, you have to have more of it and more and more and more just to maintain that same pleasure, which I do agree. Then the next one is um, what what did it say? It was uh, like success, um, success in business or or job. That'll give you a little bit more fulfillment or happiness in life. Uh, the third, which was morality, I believe he said, which will is something doing something for others. I, and he said that the psychologists found that to be the, to be the most rewarding, which I do agree on all of those things. Because drugs, when you're doing drugs, you're in an absolute high. When the drugs is over with, you, that's it. You're not high. You're not happy anymore. And then when you, as you continue to take more of it, it requires more and more and more to maintain that same level of happiness. It happens to, well, I, I assume it happens to all drugs. I don't know if it's all drugs or not, but there are some drugs where you have to continuously take more just to get the same high effect. Um, being successful in business is fantastic and great, but once you achieve your success, what then? For, uh, so that's why that's the second level of high, uh, happiness. And the third, which was the serving other people, your family, seeing your child grown succeed, that gives you great happiness. That happiness lasts a lot longer. If And this one usually requires a lot more time, generally speaking. And it, it has more impact in your life, which was sw what Swami was saying. And then the fourth one, which was uh, Moksha. I'm unfamiliar with that one. And that's what uh, all the gurus have been talking about, with Aturiya, basically, finding your true self. Again, very little experience with that one. Two instances, maybe, maybe. And uh, so let's go on with this one. I have a too much. That <laughs> to context. What should be the context of, context of my life? Yeah. Hmm? All right, but how to get there is the question. <laughs> so happiness is something that everybody wants. When we say happiness, suppose I offer you ecstasy, will you reject it? No. So you're settling for a mediocre desire. Uh, ecstasy is like a drug? I definitely deny because that's temporary. But then again, I guess all happiness in our minds is in a sense a drug too because <laughs> that's weird to say. But yeah, when you feel happiness, endorphins are released into your brain to say, yeah, this is a good thing. <laughs> Why I'm Drugs saying this nonetheless. Is because when you're five years of age, you're quite happy. Yes or no? You're bursting with happiness actually. By the time you, were thir you became thirty, you should have become ecstatic if natural process of life happened to you. But for some reason it got reversed. When you were happy, somebody had to make you unhappy. By the time you're thirty, somebody has to make you happy. You have reversed the equation of life. Yeah. This has happened <laughs> simply because without paying any attention as to how this one functions, we are trying to drive this. Do you… do you agree with me that this human mechanism is the most sophisticated gadget on the planet? Do you agree with me? Yes. Better than your iPhone? <laughs> yes, the eye is better than the iPhone, isn't it? <laughs> no, I knew the brand you're carrying, that's why <laughs> Now, if this is the most sophisticated gadget, have you even read the user's manual? I love how he always keeps referring to that, you know, like, life has no user's manual. The user's manual... I'll say this, maybe. <laughs> the user manual is read as you go along. You are never ahead of the page, you're always right on top of what you're doing. Whatever page you are on is what part of the life you're on. <laughs> you can always look back to see the previous pages, but you can never read forward. I don't know, I'm, I'm trying to sound like a smart ass here. <laughs> <laughs> now, to learn how to use a phone, you read the user's manual. Such a sophisticated gadget, no attention, somehow doing it. 
if you somehow do it, what will happen? It will somehow work <laughs> If you want it to work in a precise manner, the way you want it, then you have to approach it in a certain way. Unfortunately, this is what is missing in modern times. We know how to do everything in the world, but we don't know how to do this. But mm -hmm. your experience of life here on this planet is determined by how you are right now within yourself. The clothes that you wear, the car that you parked outside, mm -hmm. the home that you live in, what kind it is does not de de determine the quality of your life. This moment, how joyful you are, how blissful you are, is the quality of your life, isn't it so? But this attention is not there because we think by fixing the world, everything will be okay. Well, in India we still fix… need to fix a lot of things, that's different <laughs> but Western world, they've <clears throat> fixed it more than they can fix it. If you fix it anymore, there will be no planet left. To that extent we've fixed it, but still people are not well. And this is why… and this is what I was talking about at the very beginning about, you know, we… we, <laughs> we need to look inwards and fix ourselves. Uh, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't necessarily Western world, because I have a feeling right now it is majority in the Western world that we look to the exterior for fixing things, which as Sadhguru has said before, which I do completely agree, we're so focused on social media about likes, <laughs> but likes and dislikes and having to please other people, which is fine, but you cannot live your life based on what other people think of you. To a degree, it should matter, but the most important thing that matters is you. Obviously, you can't go and harm other people and all that, obviously, but I think in said Guru said, again, another thing which I genuinely do believe and I've said before um, was the fact that you are responsible for yourself. Osho said that too, but you are responsible for yourself and your happiness. Absolutely. You cannot change anything around you. I mean, you could to a degree, but the most things that you can change is, is it's inside of you. You have to be able to be happy with yourself, absolutely. And if you're going, and Sadhguru said this part, which I absolutely love. If you're trying to make, if you're trying to make your surrounding to make you happy, that is going to be very hard. Even rich people try that, and they're still unhappy. <laughs> what is it? Uh, I think they say that. How do I say this? Um, People who are in the around the middle bracket of richness, like not middle earners, they're not above average or below average. Around the average earners, I believe, are generally the happiest people. They're not they're not making six figures. They're not you know above average in earners, but they tend to be. I think they tend to be the happiest group, if I remember correctly. Now that statistic could have changed, but that's kind of weird to say that. Money doesn't bring you happiness, but I'll put an asterisk to that saying that it does help though. <laughs> it's nice not to have to worry about your next bill. Over 40% of United States population uh -oh. at some point in their life are on some kind of psychiatric medita medication. Hmm. Quick fixes. What this means is nearly half the population will go mad if you just withdraw a few pharmaceutical formulations <laughs> in the marketplace. If you just take away these formulations, nearly half the population will go crazy. Do you call this well-being, the richest nation on the planet? And we are aspiring to go there. That's not a place to go for 1.25 billion people. Yes, because the… first of all, it's not practical because, you know, the living earth statistic says, if you have to provide the kind of comfort and convenience an average American enjoys on a daily basis to seven billion people, which is the population of the world, you need four and a half planets. <laughs> but you have only half a planet left, one half has been eaten already, only half left and how will you provide this to everybody? This type of lifestyle, this type of governance, this type of economy has… is an inheritance from imperialist times when they always believed that a small part of the population will live well, rest will be exploited. That was the intention with which these models were formed. We are continuing the same models, this is not going to work. 
if we are interested in everybody's well-being, we need to rethink the whole thing in the outside world. So let's leave what we have to do outside. Outside has to be sensibly conducted, that's a different matter. But what is the context of your life? The word yoga means this, you know, it's been said and repeated too often, yoga staha kuru karmani, what this means is establish yourself in yoga and then act, everything will be okay. You don't need morals, you don't need ethics, you don't need values, you don't need anything. Just establish yourself in yoga, then act. Oh, so if I sit in one asana, everything will be okay in my life? No. When we say yoga, the word yoga means union. That means you are no more an individual, you have experienced a dimension beyond your individuality. How can that be? See, today it's a well-known scientific fact that what you call as an individual is this boundary, isn't it, of your body and your physical stature. It is a well-known thing that approximately once in two, two and a half years, all the atoms in your body have changed. You don't even have the same body. Every two years you have a new body. How can you even claim this is mine? This is all… it is going all the time. Fifty-two percent of your body happens to be bacteria. How can you claim <laughs> it is mine? You, your bacteria are yours? Ninety percent of the DNA in this body is not even human. How can you say this is me? So now, what you call… That's an interesting question. If it's a part of you, then it wouldn't… well, if it's going about the Turiya, then that's a different story. Outside of that, if it's a part of you, then why can it… why can it not be you? I mean, if you cut off my finger, it was a part of me and it's still mine. Even though we probably have similar gut bacteria, especially in, in when you talk about certain regions of the world, because of the food that you eat, what you consume, well, generally you'll have the same bacteria around the people around you. Even though they're similar, but because they're in your body, they're yours, right? I mean, they're part of you, when not necessarily like you, like, it's weird to say ownership, but they're part of you, whether you control them or not. Like, you don't necessarily control your heart, but it is part of you. It automatically beats for you. Your brain controls that automatically. You don't have a, an on and off switch for your heart. Breathing, on the other hand, you cannot necessarily stop yourself from breathing. There may be some people who can, but if you try, you'll, you'll end up gasping for air I don't, I don't know if you can really go all the way with that. Don't try that at home at all. Or don't try it at all. Anywhere. No matter what. What else is there? But, I don't know. I mean, outside of the Turiya part, the true you, you can claim things to be part of you. It may not... Uh, part of you. What is part of you is you. Let me just go on with that, because I really need to think about that. But it, but what he was saying about the uh, you being a completely new being every... I, I thought it was eight years. I, uh, maybe some... I don't know. It was a two? He says two to three years. I thought it was eight. I don't remember. But at some years, you end up replacing all the cells in your body, which I did hear that. But it's... But it's still you... I guess you could say the pen which is mine is not part of you but it is yours but it's not part of the body when you swallow it it might become part of the body but it's still a oh man I am confused on that part I, is myself. I need to think about that a little bit more but I hope you understand what I'm saying which you probably don't because that was confusing let's do a simple experiment just take your right hand and oh, touch God, your here. left hand <laughs> is this you? is this you? yes Yes. Touch the chair on which you're sitting, is this you? No? How do you know this? Just sensations, isn't it? Here you have sensation, here no sensation. Mm. Or in other words, what are you saying? Whatever is in the boundary of my sensation is me. Whatever is outside the boundary of my sensation is not me. Right now there is some water here. Is this you? 
If you drink it, it becomes you. Part of you. Yes, every day you're doing the act, isn't it? What is not you has become you, why? Simply because you included it in the boundaries of your sensation. Whatever is within the boundaries of your sensation is you. Now, if you do simply as much as rub your hands quickly and hold it like this, you will see something will be happening between your hands. This is what you're supposed to do first thing in the morning in India, that you must rub your hands and do this just to give you an experience of that you are not limited to your sensory body. You just open up, you might have lost your awareness to bring it back. First thing is to rub it like this. Just do this and hold it. Suddenly something is happening between the two hands because the sensory body with any vigorous or intense energy process, the sensory body will expand. Suppose you're sitting here, I can teach you a simple method with which your sensory body, let's say, became as big as this hall. Now suddenly, all these people who are sitting in this hall are a part of you, like the water that you drank, like the five fingers of your hand, like that you… if you experience all these people, after that, do I have to teach you morality, don't harm this person, don't rob this person, don't kill this person, thou shall not, thou shall not, thou shall not, would you need this teaching? Would you need any morality, I'm asking? What you experience as myself, with that, you don't need any value, any morality, any ethic, you're perfectly fine. This is the fundamental dharma, yogasthakur karmani, that means first establish yourself in the nature of life, because the nature of life is in union. You're not happening here separately. As you sit here, what you exhale, the trees are inhaling, what the trees exhale, you're inhaling. Half your lungs are hanging up on the tree. <laughs> yes, it is. <laughs> Yes, it is, isn't it so? So, your experience of individuality is essentially because you're very identified with your physical body. Mm. So that's why I'm telling you this is fifty per fifty-two percent bacteria, I'm sure that part you don't want to identify, ninety percent you're not even human, I'm sure you don't want to identify with that, and every two years it's changing, so you don't know what the hell you are. I will still say, I will identify as the bacteria, because that is part of me and it's what's helping me live. The 92% DNA that's not human, well, that is still part of me, regardless of whether it's human or not. But I think what it, I, but it was, I never heard that, the 92% uh, DNA is not human. I've not heard of that, I definitely got to check that out. But I get what he's saying, I get what he's saying. <laughs> there were two years, <laughs> you don't know what the hell you are. <laughs> I love that, that's amazing. But, I mean, you know what you are. It's just because it's not... Because your body's not, like, freaking dying all at one time and then recomposing in itself. <laughs> it's one piece at a time, and you don't notice those changes at all because it's kind of like uh, if you replace a piece of your house, one piece at a time, but you don't notice it, it's still, to you, the same house. Even though all the pieces have been replaced, it's the same structures, the same place, the same identifiers, same color, same... Well, I guess it would not be the same smell, though. Well, no, it would be. Small pieces at a time will not have an overwhelming smell effect. <laughs> but you get my point, too. But I get his point, too. And I, I will not talk about what I talked with my friend about and, and start about Star Trek and the transporter thing. <laughs> So there is no point identifying with a physical process because this is just a piece of this planet that you picked up. Before you and me came here, countless number of people lived on this planet. Where are they? They're all topsoil. <laughs> this Such will also become topsoil <laughs> soon, unless they choose to bury you real deep, your friends, fearing that you may raise from the dead. You know, in some places there is such reputation. So that's why in India, we want to make sure once they're dead, they're never again coming back. So we burn them, take the ashes, throw it in three separate places so that they don't come together and somehow pop up again on us. <laughs> once they're dead, they must be dead. <laughs> Very wise culture, you know <laughs> So what you're calling as myself right now is just an accumulation of things. What you call as your body is something that you accumulate, accumulated over a period of time by eating food, isn't it? 
what you call as my mind, the content of your mind is essentially an accumulation of impressions. So what you gather, at the most you can claim it's mine. You cannot say it's me, isn't it? As I'm sitting here, suddenly I take this vessel and say, this is my vessel. What will you think? Sadhguru's got some problem. But let's, let us listen some more because people say he's wise <laughs> and you sit for some more time. Then after some time I said, this is me. Then you find out then it's crazy. Then you say, let's go <laughs> Because if I claim this vessel is me, obviously madness is set in, isn't it? <laughs> yes or no? Every day you're doing this, food appears on your plate, this, you say, this is my food, you eat it and then you say, it's me. <laughs> and then when it comes out, it's no longer me <laughs> Yes, every day. Your only comfort is, everybody around you is in the same state. But just because everybody around you is in the same state, it doesn't release you from suffering. When I say suffering, this is simple. If you follow the laws which govern this, you can go without suffering. If you do not understand the laws, you trip at every point. This is not that somebody is punishing you. It is just that if you… if I do not understand the law of gravity and I just try to walk off the stage, I will pay a price, it doesn't matter who I am, isn't it? It doesn't matter how big a yogi you think I am, but if I walk off this, something will happen, isn't it? Yes or no? Because this is the law. If you go like this, you will fall. Similarly with inner nature, with subjectivity, there are laws. If you do not understand that, if you do not go by that, then you will pay a price. All human suffering is just this. There are only two kinds of suffering – mental suffering, physical suffering, yes? Unless you have an ailment or you've been in a war zone, how much phys physical suffering has happened to you in the last twenty-five years? Nothing much, nobody has caused anything to you. If at all, if physical suffering, most people suffer indigestion <laughs> okay. <laughs> Some people are suffering, unfortunately, hunger, some people indigestion. Otherwise, no physical suffering has really happened to you. So largely it is mental suffering. Mental mm. suffering means your own mind is beginning to work against you. That means your mind is not taking instructions from you. If your mind does not take instructions from you, medically also you qualify for madness. Yes. Just the comfort is everybody is in the same state. But just imagine, I want you to just imagine this. If I ask this question to anybody in the world, hardly there are a handful of people. How many people can say they have even spent one single twenty-four hour segment, that is one single day in their life, without a moment of anxiety, fear, tension, stress, nothing, simply blissed out? I may have, but I will not say I was blissed out. There's never a day where I'm blissed out. But I can maybe say that I've not never I'm not usually ang anxious of anything. I'm not fearful of anything. I do get tension sometimes. I do get stressed sometimes, but for the most part I'm not really anxious, fear, tension or stress, but I'm not blissed out, so I cannot say that I'm blissed. I cannot say that I'm that. I'm definitely not always blissed out. I don't even know if I'm ever blissed out, but I know I'm not anxious, fear, tension, stress all the time. The only thing that comes up more often is maybe stress and tension, occasionally. How many? Hardly any. See, if one day does not happen the way you want it, it's understandable. Not even one day happen the way you want it. This means something fundamentally it's off, you're off the rails, isn't it? If not a single day happened the way you want it, something is fundamentally off the rails. One fundamental thing is just this, what you have gathered, you believe is you. The moment you think you are this vessel, if I just do this to the vessel, it hurts. <laughs> to hurt you, we don't have to hurt you physically. Something that you identify with, if you just knock on it, it hurts you, isn't it? Hmm. Yes or no? If I break your house, your heart will break. 
because so much identification has happened, the fundamental thing is this, you believe yourself to be something that you are not. Once you believe yourself to be something that you are not, insanity has begun. In what form it finds expression, how much provocation happens in your life will decide how far you will go. So the first and foremost thing in yoga is if you sit here, if you know what is you, what is not you, what is accumulation and what is not accumulation, if this much awareness enters your life, now you know what to do. If you experience everybody here as a part of yourself, you will not have to be told how to act in the world, isn't it? You know how to act in the world. Okay, well that ended. <laughs> All right. I was trying to think about the uh, when he was saying about the if the house is broken, you what's do you feel broken? Your heart's broken. Let me try going back to that real quick. Qualify for madness. Single twenty-four hours on the way you want it. To hurt you, we don't have to hurt. Believe yourself to be something that you are not. Once you believe yourself to be something that you are not, insanity has begun. In what form it finds expression, how much provocation happens in your life will decide how far you will go. So the first and foremost thing, if I break your house, your heart will break. Because so much identification has happened, the fundamental thing is this, you believe yourself to be something that you are not. Hmm. <clears throat> okay, so I thought he meant that you identify in a sense as the house, but it's more along the lines that because your heart breaks that you identify, because you identify the emotion of heartbreak and that's yourself. But I mean, I understand, uh, generally speaking, if you work hard at something and then say you spent five years working at something or just say, let's, let's go with the house analogy. It takes you 30 years to pay off that house. It's finally yours. You no longer owe the bank anything. The bank has signed off saying this is your, officially your house now. All of a sudden it burns down. 30 years of your life, hard work, gone. <laughs> Trust me, I feel that pain too. <laughs> 30 years and uh, it's gone like that. But I understand what it's saying. It's it's very hard to say separate separate yourself from your feelings. But if you find a way and how basically your feelings is not you, which I do understand because it's and it's something that uh, Swami said that what you experience cannot be you. Which is a, a very interesting question. A very interesting question. I've talked to my friend about that one actually. He had a very interesting answer, which was kind of similar to mine. But in a ways, but yeah. So if you can find a way to ensure, I guess, is it saying that if you can find your true self, which will not be sad, because your emotion is not you, therefore you you cannot be sad, is essentially what he's saying. I do believe. And I do understand that, but it, I, I guess I understand that it's, it's just super hard for <laughs> for 30 years of your life paying off that bill to finally be out of debt and then all of a sudden it's gone. And this is something also that my world, uh, world religions teacher, uh, when we went to Buddhism, where they say life is suffering and that is a great example of it. The, the example that was given to me was childbirth. I was like, whenever she first told me that, I'm like, childbirth is usually celebrated as something as a happy occasion. But then the pain of childbirth, and I was like, uh, yeah, okay, <laughs> I get it. I get it. And this is, this is what I call learning a hard way. Anytime that you have to pay in pain and suffering, and that you paid for it to gain that knowledge, that is learning the hard way. The easy way is watching someone go through that suffering and saying, I don't want to do that. <laughs> that is the easy way. But sometimes you end up end up learning the hard way again in a way. <laughs> it's like stubbing your toe and like, I should have brought a flashlight. <laughs> well anyways, that's my reaction to how to decide the right path. If you like my content, please consider subscribing. Thumbs up, thumbs down, down below. Thanks for watching. I'll see you at the next vid.